I'm Finn. I'm sorry. And this is blah, 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 King's King, X, the mission. The mission. For Southern Dusted. Uh, King's X is a band I hear a lot about. Um, yeah. But I think we've only done like one one song from them hmm. in our in our uh, tenure. Yeah. Um, so this should be interesting. Seven Kings. Dusted always brings us some good songs. Yeah. Shout out to the big homie Seven Dusted. For timely topical political commentary, you can hit us up at Middle America with Vin and Sori. Where is the lyrics for this song? We are still on the market for our house. <coughs> Looking for a house, Seven Dusted. <laughs> oh, did he, as lucky as <laughs> did he ask about that? Well, I mean, they were looking at the same time as we were looking, then they found something much more quickly than we have. Oh, okay. Um, so, there you go. You can hit us up for timely topical political commentary at Middle America with Vinny and Sori. And there are also multiple ways to get your song reviewed. My favorite is a community option. One dollar at the gate gets you in at Patreon and you join an alliance. Mm -hmm. And alliances are their own little subculture within the village. If you want to join the village, it's very simple. Facebook.com backslash Vin and Sori and you're in. Uh, I talk on there. I post on there. Everybody posts on there. has their little thing. Um, but if you want to get into a sub community within that, one dollar at the gate gets you in at Patreon. Now, if you're a filthy capitalist like Sorry and you don't want to wait and you just want to housekeep and jump in front of the line, 125 gets you to the head of the line. Or uh, once you've done that three times, you get bumped down to the $75 rate, which is where our big homie is. And with that said, I'm actually really interested in hearing this song King's X Mission. Let's do it. Here we go. Gretchen goes to Nebraska. Oh my gosh. It's unnerving. <laughs> Wow. 
Wow. Good job. I didn't really see this as an anti-Christian song. No. Was it supposed to be anti-Christian? Well, I, I could see how people would take it as an anti-Christian song. But I don't see this as a... No. As a... No, I don't either. It's this guy has to know some it seems Christian like he's theology. Challenging. Yeah, and he's got to know some Christian theology, because a broken body gets joints at war. Mm -hmm. He's talking about the body of Christ, yeah. obviously. And you know, was it one Corinthians twelve? I think you know, we're all part of the body. Yeah, the hand can't say to the foot, "I have no need of you." Yada yada yada. At f that first part, <clears> I thought <throat> this was going to be like a song about war. Like yeah, because you said, "Oh, this is a political song." Before we loaded up. That's why I mentioned the timely topic, but it really isn't political. Uh -uh. But it's not a, it's not an anti. This is actually a pretty unique one because um, he says, um, "Who are those people behind the stained glass windows? Have have they forgotten just what they came here for? Was That's it salvation sad. or scared of hell yeah. or an assembly of the social get together?" Um, That's not like saying that you know you've got the Nergal type well, you know anti Christian lyrics, but this is not really. An anti-Christian lyric. It's more of a challenge as to, you know, what's the point. The fact that he says, "Have they forgotten what they came here for?" Right. Means there is something other than what they're doing. Yeah. One of the most curious things I've ever heard John Piper say, and I actually agree with it, is if you are with Jesus only because you want to escape hell, you're going to hell. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, holy moly. Yeah. He's right, though. Um, and he said, heaven is for those who love God and Christ. It's mm -hmm. not for those who <clears throat> want to escape hell. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're, if you're just using Jesus' fire insurance, then <laughs> it's a sign that you're going to hell. Mm -hmm. I thought that that was a... And obviously, when you read the New Testament, like, the, the, when you look at the apostolic witness... Especially in the book of Acts, mm. you almost never hear any threats about hell. Yeah. You know, it's about being part of the covenant. No. Um, the closest, I think, is Peter when he says, save yourselves from this wicked generation, which we know is specifically about 70 AD. Yep. Um, because the Christians did save themselves because they, they, um, they believed Christ was the Messiah and Christ prophesied that their, <clears throat> the entire thing would be destroyed. How within a generation. Times, how many times is the word hell used in the Bible? Well, I, I I think that that's probably not a good measure, right? Because Jesus very few, he, he very rarely used the word hell, but he would talk about outer darkness or he would talk about being torn to pieces or mm -hmm. he would talk about weeping and gnashing of teeth, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. So Jesus did use the term hell. And then, of course, you've got the translational issues like Gehenna versus Sheol, the world of the dead, and uh, Peter, I think T. Peter uses the word Tartarus, actually, which in Greek mythology is where the um, the really, really bad people went, mm -hmm. it's Tartarus. So, I guess the reason I'm bringing it up is because, like, what, fear not is there, like, 365 times or something like that. Like, it's, right, like, don't almost, be afraid is yeah. mentioned 365 times in the Bible. Yeah, so it's like, right. but then a lot of times, you know, sometimes, depending on where you are, they'll mention hell, 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 right. as a way to make you fear right. and, like, bring you into right. doing what it is that they want you to do. That's a good point. The phrase, do not be afraid, is mentioned 365 times. And, you know... They're, they're, they always say one for every day of the this is year. Just like these, you know... I'm not gonna say they're silly criticism, but they're uninformed criticisms about, you know, it's like Christianity promotes mm -hmm. fear. It's like, well, you, you can't say that a book that says literally 365 times not, not to, be, to afraid. be afraid. You cannot say that that book is promoting fear. <laughs> right. But the issue is there are realities in the world that people need to be afraid of or cautious of or whatever. Yeah. And, and like, it, it's really interesting because the same group of people that say that Christianity is all fear-mongering, or the same group of people that say, that criticize Trump for, in my opinion, rightly, for not taking COVID seriously enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But those people are saying, oh, you're just fear-mongering. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, no, if there are objective realities that can cause us harm, 
then we need to be made aware of it. And uh, hello, you know, a little fear is not bad in that type of a situation. Yeah, it's not it's not fear mongering <coughs> to warn your children about strangers or the street. Yeah, or 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 COVID nineteen. Or COVID nineteen. Um, you know, you were to say, you know, you probably shouldn't go to that, you know, giant gathering of human beings where everybody's gonna be smushed on top of each other, yeah. and nobody's wearing masks and you can't social distance. Now, I've had people say things like that's fear mongering, but uh, I don't believe that that's fear mongering. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely, um, you know, as the old preachers used to say, a heaven to be gained and a hell to be avoided. Yeah. Um, I agree with that, but that doesn't mean that that's fear-mongering. If hell is an objective reality, then we should be told about it. Right. <laughs> Obviously, Jesus talked about the kingdom of God more than he talked about, you know, the bad place, hell, whatever you want to call it, weeping and gnashing of teeth, outer darkness, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus' initial declaration was not repent or else you're going to hell. Jesus' original declaration was repent for the kingdom of right. God is near. And then even after the resurrection, you see in uh, at the end of Luke, in the beginning of Acts, that what was he talking about? He wasn't talking about hell. He was talking about the kingdom of God. It mm -hmm. says he was talking to them about the scriptures and the kingdom of God. And so the last thing that Peter says to Jesus is, Lord, are you now going to restore the kingdom? Mm -hmm. He doesn't say, Lord, are you going to now save us from hell? Right, right. So my point is the main thrust of the of the New Testament, I mean, you 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 can only find one. I mean, the Old Testament is the bulk of the Bible, and you can only find about one reference maybe to hell in Isaiah, and most commentators say that the, it's not about hell. Um, so you cannot say that a book that is uh, telling you not to be afraid 365 times, talking about this kingdom that's coming, you cannot say that, it, that, that the whole thing is about fear and all mm -hmm. the rest of it. Uh, hell exists, but I think, you know, I've talked about it before, that hell is basically a combination of the walking dead and the, uh, and the purge mm -hmm. for yeah. eternity. Yeah. Hell is where people who do not want to be part of God's kingdom through Christ go to set up their own kingdom. And um, without God's gracious influence, the society that those people would create is what we would call hell by observation. If you observe the society of a godless yeah. people that have no influence of God. And this is, this is a difference when I say that there's no divine influence. Because when I say godless, people go, look at Sweden, look at this, look mm -hmm. at that. What I'm talking about is no influence of God. So. Right. The fact that uh, human beings are not living in the purge right now from a Christian theological perspective is only due to the restraining hand of God or the positive influence of God mm -hmm. that, um, that calls upon the image of God in all of us. Mm -hmm. But we have never seen a human being exist without the image of God. And we have never seen a world exist without the grace of God. C correct. God being just giving you something that you don't deserve. Correct. 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 So, so when people, I mean, even the worst, you know, version of humanity that we can think of, which is Hitler, right? For some reason, like there have been people that have killed more. The atheist communists killed way more people than Hitler did. But let's mm -hmm. let's stay with Hitler. He still had the image of God in him. He had the capacity for love. He had a mistress. He had a kitten that he loved. You know what I mean? Like, so, so he, and I'm sure if you, you know, a lot of these bad people, like these, like, notoriously globally bad people, when you get them alone by themselves without their mm -hmm. goons, they're very nice and polite individuals. <laughs> I've, I've been in some rooms with some yeah. <laughs> really hard dudes who a lot of people would be surprised when they were by themselves. They were very, very nice and, and uh, uh, complicit, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so my point is we've never seen um, a person or a society devoid of the image of God mm -hmm. and devoid of God's influence in the world. We've never seen that. Mm -hmm. And so what, you know, the closest I can come to it is uh, if I'll find the link, I can put it down uh, in the, in the description. The closest I could come is there was this uh, special by Vice. It was actually the very first Vice documentary that I watched. Yeah. And it was called The Vice Guide to Liberia. And if you Google that and check that out, I mean, it was horrible, the society of those people. And we're talking about cannibalism. 
We're talking about, you know, dudes who would like go to war with their neighbors and before they went to war they would sacrifice a kid. You had this guy that was running all these child soldiers. I mean, it was like, it was unbelievable. Oh my gosh. Um, but even in that hell, uh, there is still a lot of image of God and there's still a lot of uh, uh, humanity doing good things and Liberia has slowly changed into something, mm -hmm. you know. But, but, so when I look at Liberia, I'm like, holy moly, that, yeah. that's, like, that's hell. Like, on earth, as close as I could see it, you know. So, um, so when I, when I think about hell, it's, it's a, it's a place where people go and What they, was it called? What? The Vice Guide to Liberia. Uh, yeah, if you can get that, um, you can see. I mean, it's a pretty, it's a pretty horrific, uh, uh, Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, I think it's so, right there. this yeah. one? Yeah. Yeah. 53 minute one. Yeah, I mean, it's horrible. And it's, it's very graphic, too, so... I, I remember seeing a piece of it, I think. It's horrible, horrible, horrible. I'll try to add it into the description. So, so that is a society, like, devoid of divine influence. Mm -hmm. so that would be hell, right? So, I don't believe that you can make a, a solid, like, Genesis to Revelation case that God is, like, lighting people on fire for all eternity, yada, yada, yada. I don't think you can make a very good case for that. Um, but that doesn't mean, just because that that's not happening in hell doesn't mean that, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, <laughs> Jesus, uh, Jesus said that's not a place you want to go. Mm -hmm. It's not a place you want to go. Um, and then the ability to reason is also looked upon as a divine grace in Romans chapter 1. Yeah. So, the, uh, the ability to apply a, a rational mind is also a gift of grace that if God takes from you, again, we've never seen a person in completely devoid of rationality. Nope. Um, we have seen criminally insane people, but they still function with logical syllogisms, especially mm -hmm. as it relates to taking care of their own agendas. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, criminally insane people are usually sociopathic and, and center themselves and use logic to serve themselves. But what if you were in a situation where everybody you were losing, you were completely losing your ability to, to rationalize anything, which is very interesting. It's one of the reasons why at the end of Revelation, the gates are spoken of as being open. Mm -hmm. And then it talks about the bad guys outside and it never says they want to go inside. Mm -hmm. Because the farther and farther you develop in hell, the more and more irrational you become. Yeah. There would be no morality there either. And there would be no justice. Well, yeah. That's why I said it's like the purge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, but in the purge, like, people that are, like, crazy, like, they ended up getting killed. So you kind of get that feeling of justice? Well, you as the observer get a feeling of justice. But the people in that world, there's no there's no nothing. It's just survival at that point. Well, yeah, but the morning was going to come and then that was going to have to stop. But in hell, it wouldn't be like that. Well, and there would correct. only be, that would just keep, right. and if everybody is living without dying, then right. there's no, there's not even the justice of, like what, being, like what the observer saw on the purge when the person... Uh, shove the knife into the person they dropped to the ground it was kind of like okay good that one's down but there would be none of that because everybody mm -hmm. lives forever so it's like yeah that, and a cross between that and the pirates of the caribbean yeah but you're <laughs> you're, you're living you're you're living um the the longer and longer you um exist in that world the less and less and less rational you become. yeah but would you still long for justice I think you would at the beginning, and then eventually when you wouldn't you care. Had, when like, you had isn't a rational... the idea that you would want justice but wouldn't be able to get it? Isn't that more tormenting than just not caring? Well, no, anymore? because wanting justice is an aspect of the image of God on a person. Well, I know. So you're losing that for all eternity, and then you're losing the ability to rationalize anything. Yeah, but when you get to a point, if you were living for all eternity, where you wouldn't care anymore, like oh, isn't I, the fact that you have an understanding? That's I agree. what you think's gonna happen. Yeah, I. I so you I, don't think it's torment forever? Well, no. I, look, you you have to understand like. They'll be like the if, if somebody kid. if somebody's in an insane in a in an insane asylum, mm -hmm. and they think that they're in whatever they think they're the present they they're under some yeah. crazy delusion, 
on the one hand, as the outside observer, we would go, man, that guy's, we, you'd say that guy's in a pitiful situation. Everybody would feel bad for him. Mm -hmm. Because we know objectively that he's suffering. But he could be so crazy and hopped up on meds that he doesn't know that he's suffering. You see what I'm saying? So he could be suffering uh, without the knowledge of the fact that he's actually suffering because he's so deluded in the mind. So uh, my understanding of hell is like, is like 10 trillion years from now that the only thing that they would know is that they exist and that would be it. Their ability to rationalize and things like that are, are going to be completely gone and their entire existence is going to be nothing but pure chaos. Which is really interesting because um, Vatain, like the dude from Vatain, like that's that's his branch of Satanism. It's like chaos, something, something, something. Mm -hmm. um, which is what you have when you build, you lose the ability to reason with your yeah with your mind. But all of those things are stamps of the image of God, and there you go. If you don't have that on you, then you don't have that on. Yikes. So. Um, you know, those are all, you know, so we, we talked a lot about hell. We actually did a Bible boogie on hell. It's very, mm -hmm. very interesting, which we basically took the Eastern Orthodox understanding of hell or the lake of fire particularly because in at one point in Revelation, there is a, a, a stream of a river of life mm -hmm. flowing from the throne of God. Yeah. And then the other part of Revelation, there's a river of fire yep. that goes into the lake of yep. fire that that also comes from the throne of God and so the conclusion that we came to collectively was that the lake of fire is the unbelievers experience or apprehension of the presence of God and the river of life is the believers apprehension of the presence of God to a believer mm -hmm. God's presence is refreshing it's cleansing and it's life-saving mm -hmm. To an unbeliever, God's presence is tormenting, et cetera, et cetera. But you're, the, the burden of existence is such that, well, uh, there's no place in the universe where he isn't. Yeah, I mean, it's like <clears throat> the water to a fish is exactly what they want. The water to a scorpion will kill it, you know. Right, 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 right. So, uh, there you go. That's why hell is a place that you should avoid, but... <laughs> it's to be avoided. It's to, it's to be avoided. <laughs> but, but it's one of those things where it's like, on the one hand, people go, oh, I don't want to go to heaven and worship God, and I want to go to hell with my friends. And so, so, like, the first day you're in hell, I think those people are going to be like... I knew it. We were I knew it. Uh, and then, and then I... Uh, I've got a whole storyline of like what it would be like to exist in hell and it's like it's about a five season show and it's very very interesting it's really 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 interesting in my opinion but um, maybe we'll win the lottery or a lawsuit or something like that and you'll be able to do something crazy with it I think it'd be an interesting show I think I people go, would watch I'm sure it. it would be I think people would watch it I'm sure it would be yeah, I've got a five-season storyline. I got a lot of things in my head. I wish I could split myself into like nine people. I'd be able to accomplish like fifty percent of what I want. Mm. I've lived a lot of places. You know what I mean? Yeah. I remember when we were kids one time. We were, we were uh, in the sandbox, and there was like some like like metal thing at the bottom of the sandbox. I don't know what it was. Uh, but we were at Catholic school, and my friend was like, yo, you can hear people in hell under there. And I was like, what? He's like, yeah, can't you hear it? I put my ear to the... I was like, oh, no, I can hear it. I didn't hear a damn thing. Ah! Oh, no, I can hear it. <laughs> he, was, he was like, don't you hear it? Get me out, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, wouldn't it be hot? You know? He's like, ah, yeah, that's not how it works. I was like, oh, okay. Oh, this kid must know. He goes to Catholic school. I was in Catholic school. What do I know about it? Uh, but but it really that question what is the mission of the preacher man is a very significant question mm -hmm. because and I say this all the time in you know Bible boogies or in when I do a fireside right and and people ask me um, you know about that I, I always say like I'm not a very big afterlife person mm -hmm. I do talk about the next world or the new world but I'm not a very big afterlife person because um, our mission is to bring forth the kingdom of God in the here and now. Mm -hmm. And that absolutely has political implications. Right. It absolutely. People who are like, oh, Christians should stay out of politics. Um, Christians are saying this. I'm like, what are you talking about? You think what Jesus says, uh, the kingdom of God is at hand, that they yeah. were thinking of some spiritual floaty place? Like, they weren't thinking that. 
I mean, even after Jesus rose from the dead, they had no idea that Jesus was going to leave. Right. They were like, hey, you're going right. to set up the kingdom now? So, like, they had a very this world political understanding of what Jesus was going to do, and so do I. Which is why I don't have a problem with imposing Christian Sharia in the world. Mm -hmm. Hey, if you're a sex trafficker, I don't give a damn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to impose that on you. Right. Right? Yeah. Like, I don't have yeah, a problem. I agree. You know, so, um, you know, when people hear Christian Sharia, they think, oh, I'm talking about you have to go to church and all that. No. No. Uh, but you can't, you can't sex traffic people. You can't kill people. You can't sexually exploit people. And I don't care what your opinion is. Mm -hmm. You're wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're not going to vote on it. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to vote as to whether or not you can. And, you know, there are lots of secular humanist moralities that overlap with, with Christian moralities um, on almost everything. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got, I've got secular atheist friends that abhor abortion worse than we do. Uh, Albany Rose being one. Yep. Um, there are yep. there are pro life anarchists. There are you know my man Alec is is putting out a lot of um, information about the porn industry and things like that. Oh Alec, really? Yeah, really? Yeah. Alec, yeah, yeah, yeah. Alec is my scientist guy, and you know he's he, he just posted a fight the new drug thing a couple uh, yesterday. Hmm, interesting. So like, there's a lot of overlap between secular humanism and and. Um, mm -hmm and all that jazz. So those are all things that that is should be the mission of the preacher man. The preacher man should be Absolutely. in the middle of every social issue. Absolutely. Every Christian should hear about Medicare for all. Whether or not you agree with it. Whether or not you agree with it and they take a side whatever, but people should know. Do you know there's 28 million uninsured? Do you know there's there's 28 yeah. year old kids dying because they're aging out of their that, like the preacher should be talking about that mm -hmm. from the pulpit, whether or not you're going to lose your five hundred one c three. I agree. Blah, blah, I don't care. I agree. You know, but the most that we have is congregants. Is John MacArthur saying? Tithe. John MacArthur saying, if you vote for Biden, you're not a Christian. Like mm -hmm. the, that's just thin, overly simplistic, yeah. unnuanced, ridiculous. Uh, nonsense. That it's almost as crazy. That that it almost as crazy as Joe Biden says. If you don't vote for me, you're not black. Like literally, they're in the same category. Mm -hmm. Literally, when you make yourself completely focused on the afterlife, there are certain theologies that are just absolutely horrible for any sort of social change. Right. So like this whole rapture theology, where oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> Things are going to get really, really horrible, and then God's going to zap us out of the way. Yep. It creates a complete complacency and laziness, and it actually works the opposite of what Jesus is trying to do. Mm -hmm. Because when you see bad things happening, you don't go, holy crap, the church has to address that. You say, great, let's hope it he's gets worse, that. because get he's going to he's gonna rapture us. And I remember, I'll never forget, people were celebrating 9-11 because they knew it was going to mean war in the Middle East. And in their, in their theology, the Middle East is always going to be at war, which Jesus never yeah, says that. Show me one that. verse where Jesus ever said the Middle East is always going to be at war. But these people believe, and there are brothers and sisters, so when they saw 9-11 happen, they were happy. Because they were like, this is going to trigger war in the Middle East, and that means the Antichrist is already alive, and he's going to set up a peace deal, and by that time we'll have well been gone, and so we've got 10 years left, and they were very happy about that so mm -hmm. the afterlife stuff and the rapture stuff I, I, I listen I, I've spent countless hours and spent countless thousands of dollars in investing in searching researching that issue so it's important to me but good night it's been absolutely horrific mm -hmm. as far as um, <coughs> the Christian church goes mm -hmm. in, in America so there you are so there's so many, you know, a lot of times I say, like, there's, like, one line or two words. I'm like, I could spend five hours on that. And That's one of them. <laughs> watch a Bible boogie. You'll see. I can spend five hours on that. <laughs> uh, what do you give the song? Uh, oh, boy. I think it's a 9.9. .9. I Maybe give it a, a 9.5. Uh, 9.5 for me. I think I'm going to go with a 10 because I don't think that there's anything that I would have changed. And the reason why I'm giving it a 10 is not just because I really liked what it sounded like. I liked instrumentally what they did, that creepy sound at the beginning. I was like, what's happening? And then well, it went heavy. So that was really cool. Like it kind of just set you on edge when you first heard the beginning. And then when the instruments came in, they were like heavy and clear and good. Um, 
and the vocal style, everything was really, really good about it. And I think that because I'm a Christian, the message is super important to me. So maybe normally I wouldn't give it a 10, probably would give it like a 9.8, but I think I'm going with a 10 because I think it's wildly important. It's important for the preacher to know what his mission is. And when he says some are true, some do lie, it's true. Some of them are really good and some of them are really bad. Some of them really just want your money and they really don't care about you. But some of them really, really do care about you and um, and want to see do. yeah and want to see do. you do well and want to see you you know come to know the God that they love and they love and they trust. So, um, but I think it's it's definitely a question that has to be asked and a question that has to be answered, especially within the church. There's been a lot of craziness that's gone on, gone on and a lot of I mean a lot of the people that listen to our channel, you know, even. <laughs> me in some ways too is like the the church has not been a place it's it's been this an assembly of a social get together and it hasn't been a place where you know the sick come to be healed or a place where you can actually get help for the issues that you have or be able to talk about your problems without it being gossiped all over the place or being judged for it so that is unfortunately such an issue that it's just kind of made a mess of what should be something super super great but he said it, a broken body, it's joints at war. Yeah, but the other thing is, just like... But I'm talking about the American church. Yeah. <laughs> because we've just met like, people from other countries that it was not their experience at all. Just like millionaires are, are the 1% in America, mm -hmm. these preachers that have Cadillacs, they're the 1% of preachers. Most preachers you're, yeah, do yeah, not you're drive Yeah, you're probably Cadillacs. right. Is yeah, it, you're probably right. Because... Around here, around here, a ton of the preachers we knew were bivocational, meaning... They preached and did all the other stuff, and then they worked because their church was just too broke to mm -hmm. to finance them. Mm -hmm. So, like it, it it's it it's something that needs to be addressed. The guy who fleeces people so he can have a Cadillac and a mansion, but but and I, I'm not even necessarily certain that Joel Olstein is in that bracket because he writes his own books and all that. And if you're a number one bestseller guy five times in a row, you're gonna have millions of dollars. Yeah. So I'm not even certain that Joe Olstein is in that category. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen, you know, people just assume that if a preacher's rich it's because he's fleecing people. Yeah. Some of these preachers are media stars. Yeah. You know, like T.D. Jakes is a media star. Like he's in movies and all that. Mm -hmm. Like, so, so I'm not, I'm not, you know, and again, you have to think with nuance. What I'm talking about though is the guy who fleeces folks for the Cadillac and all that. That's 1% of preachers that are driving around in a yeah. Cadillac. I mean, and, and, yeah. and it doesn't happen up here. Um, and I'm not saying, you know what I mean? So, like, to me, the rapture stuff is actually way more dangerous and destructive. The only thing I ever saw than, was... Uh, than the prosperity stuff. There's, like, a not local close. preacher. I don't even think he's a preacher anymore, but when I was a teenager, he used to drive around in this vehicle. I don't know anything about the Italian? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, What yeah. kind of vehicle was that? Was that anything? I don't know. Or? I don't know, but I heard about him. But yeah. like that's the thing is like there was one guy. There was one, <laughs> and everybody and everybody he knew just who he had, was. It was this big. I literally don't know what kind of. It had, his, it, was. it had his name on the back, right? No, on the it license was plate preacher. Or, 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 I think he put preacher on the license plate, and like the vehicle was all like. I I guess you could say it was all pimped out. Like that's what everybody was saying at the time. Yeah. But it was just kind of it was it was weird. I'm not. Yeah, gonna the guy lie. the guy was the talk of the town because he was the only one out of the hundreds of preachers in Maine that were doing that, that. was doing that. So it's yeah. less than one percent here. Yeah. So and, and again, I think if you go in Atlanta, it's probably it's probably different, right? I'm just saying overall. Yeah. Uh, your average preacher, but again, I don't think that that is more of a problem than the rapture theology because the rapture the theology influences how people oh, vote. Yeah. It influences you know the Christian. No, I agree. The Christian pool of capital in America, the evangelical pool of capital, is a ridiculous amount of millions. It's like the 12th richest country in the world yeah. if you just isolated evangelical Christians with their capital. So yeah. we have we have supported really just unilateral support of Israel, for example, because of that, which, yep. is, which is directly correlative to what happened in 9-11, which is directly correlative to what we've been doing in the world for eight trillion dollars over the last 20 years and it's been evangelicals who voted to go to war and evangelicals who voted to continue in war mm -hmm. because of this theology mm -hmm. so that's something that's really nuanced that doesn't get called out in the metal community but if if there was somebody in the metal community that knew the traces of all this stuff and what it's actually done foreign and domestic 
you you can make a, an entire record off of that theology. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's destructive as hell, mm -hmm. and I mean that literally. So there you are, dear listener. Well, thank you, Seven Dusted. Yeah, a lot of food for thought. Van out. Sorry out. Gone.